Thank you, thank you. I'm Jean Witowski wendy and I'm Dean of the School of Public Health and Health Professions. And it's a great pleasure to be here today to celebrate the Glenn Gresham Visiting Pro Professorship Lecture. I welcome all our students, our faculty, and guests to this uh, program. And in just a few minutes, I'll be introducing Dr. George, who will be our, our Gresham lecturer today. But before we get started, um, I wanted to give an opportunity for Dr. Dee Dee Fisher to uh, acknowledge Dr. Gresham, who unfortunately passed away this year. And Dee Dee has work with Glenn over a number of years and would like to give a short tribute. For those of you who do know Dr. or did know Dr. Gresham, um, he was very particular about the fact that his middle initial was always used and it was always ended with the MD. So I wanted to do him just, John, you can speak to that too, you know that. Um, unfortunately, we lost Dr. Gresham this year in February, um, but I just want to tell you a little bit about his, his career and how he ended up in Buffalo and, and what happened once he got here. And then a couple personal reflections that <laughs> hopefully you won't mind. Uh, so Dr. Gresham got his bachelor's degree at Harvard a long time ago, then did his uh, MD, uh, got his MD from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. He spent several years, or a bunch of years, actually traveling around to different places. He was at Case Western, Ohio State, Yale. And in the 70s, uh, he was at Tufts. University School of Medicine. And that's where he got involved with the Framingham Heart Study, which many of you uh, probably have heard about a giant epidemiologic study that, that the dean can tell you way more about than I can. Um, but Dr. Gresham was very proud of the fact that he was part of that, that, that giant study. And he did a lot of research related to stroke and stroke outcomes. And so not only did he do that back in the 70s, but 20 years after he went back, he took a sabbatical, went back and did um, a 20-year follow-up on this uh, group to see uh, what had happened. So um, anyway, uh, in 1978, Dr. Gresham was recruited to come to Buffalo to be the first permanent chair of the Department of Rehab Medicine. And uh, the, as you probably read in the, in the uh, uh, program, uh, the department was established by Dr. Recate. So um, when Dr. Gresham came to Buffalo, his areas of research that he was interested in besides stroke outcomes were osteoarthritis and functional assessment. So you probably know that functional assessment for the students that are here, it's a big deal. <laughs> and uh, certainly a lot of it started here. And he recruited other faculty to come to town that uh, were experts in functional assessment. Uh, one in particular that I can think of is Carl Granger. So um, anyway, while Dr. Gresham was here, uh, his, he, as chair of the department, he was housed at ECMC. So under his leadership at UB and ECMC, he actually developed the spinal cord injury unit that's there, uh, the traumatic brain injury unit, which at the time was the first program in Western New York for traumatic brain injury. And then uh, he also uh, helped establish in the late 70s the Center for Functional Assessment Research. So these were all... Um, very big accomplishments at the time. And then uh, not only was he doing that, but also in the early 90s, he also acted as a uh, medical director at ECMC for two years. So um, he had quite a storied career. In 1989, Dr. Recate actually, in the Department of Rehab Medicine, developed this Glenn E. Gresham MD visiting professorship. And uh, that's kind of when it started. Uh, so it, it, was, it was running there, and then when the Department of Rehab Medicine was closed, uh, luckily uh, Mrs. Recate and Dr. Gresham elected to have our department, our school, be the recipient of this uh, uh, prestigious visiting professorship. Um, I also just wanted to mention that Dr. Gresham was also the co-chair in 1992, was a co-chairperson of the expert panel for clinical practice guidelines on post-stroke rehab. Uh, he also was, a, was a, an editorial board of the journal Stroke. He w and my personal interest is rheumatology, so I found out he was one of the founding fellows of the American Rheumatism Association, which, which now is called the American College of Rheumatology. So Dr. Gresham was around here for 20 years, retired in 1998, and then moved off to Sanibel, Florida, which 
It's beautiful. <laughs> so <laughs> there's no doubt. Um, so that's kind of a, a, I mean, he has many more accomplishments that I, I, well, I cut into Steve's time, so we don't do that. But I just wanted to, to, on a personal note, tell you about Dr. Gresham, since I did work with him from 1988 to 1998. Um, he's, in, in my opinion, he's truly a gentleman by all definitions. He's a very gracious man, was very reserved in a way, but until you got to know him, then he was quite warm, and he had kind of a... Um, a bad sight, <laughs> not bad sight, <laughs> let's say funny sight to him. Um, very articulate, very eloquent. He was the most elegant writer, which any of you who are in the writing classes would know. <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, so a lot of his um, skills weren't just related to medicine, but also just general good um, etiquette, I guess. Um, I can tell you on a, on a personal note as well, he was extremely devastated and deeply saddened and disappointed when Dr. Kane closed the Department of Rehab Medicine, uh, when he found out about that. It, it really was difficult for him. And what he did I thought was a pretty classy thing is he personally, his, his handwriting was meticulous. You could, for a doctor, you could read every single, even his signature could read everything. Um, he sent each of us that had been in the department when he was a member, or when, when he was a chair, he sent each of us a, a personalized handwritten note telling us how much he appreciated what we, every one of us did and how special we made the program. So I thought that was a really classy thing for him to do. Um, the other thing is, and I just want to end with this, he was very easy to tease. And for those of you who kind of know me, I, I don't really like to tease people much, but um, he was um, easy. And um, needless to say, We'd give him a hard time, and John, you may remember this. He actually took organ lessons when he was a couple years before he retired. And when you'd ask him what he could do, he'd say, I play a mean three blind mice. <laughs> so anyway, that's all I want to say about Dr. Gresham. He was a good guy, and uh, we'll miss him. So thanks, Dee Dee. And, um, Again, to reiterate, uh, Glenn Gresham was a, a real friend of the school and uh, want to acknowledge the Recate family who established uh, the lectureship and uh, continue to support this lecture. Uh, Lynn, unfortunately, couldn't be with us today. She was with us last night. Uh, I also want to, before I introduce uh, Dr. George, just acknowledge that in fact, this year is the 50th anniversary of the founding of the School of Health-Related Professions. And for those of you that have not gotten uh, your uh, UB Health magazine yet, uh, they should be arriving in, in your uh, departments in your, at your homes. But uh, it is a, an issue that's really dedicated to the history of uh, this program. Uh, I tell this that uh, I learned my dad, who actually was a physical therapist, was uh, in the first graduating class of uh, the physical therapy program. And so we really are enjoying this year, kind of celebrating the history of what has brought us together to now our school of, of public health and health professions. And I hope you'll enjoy reading more about the history. I want to thank Mike Noe for his work and putting together some of the history, um, a video that's available online, and many others that work very hard on that. But it's, it's a fun read, and actually the pictures on the front of this issue, um, probably the students will giggle a little bit about the hairdos and the way, way people looked 50 years ago. So again, we're pleased to have Dr. Stephen George here with us today, who's an associate professor in the Department of Physical Therapy in the College of Public Health and Health Professions at the University of Florida. And he is our Gresham visiting professor. He's the director of the doctorate in physical therapy program at the University of Florida, as well as the director of the Brooks Public Health Health Professions Research Collaboration. Dr. George, his research interests that involve the utilization of the biopsychological models for prevention and treatment of chronic musculoskeletal pain 
His research projects have been supported by awards from the National Institutes of Health, Department of Dep Defense, Orthopedic Section of the American Physical Therapy Association, uh, the University of Florida, and the Foundation for Physical Therapy. His current research projects include developing and testing behavioral interventions for patients with low back pain, investigating the interaction between pain-related genetic and psychological factors in the development of postoperative chronic shoulder pain, investigating the mechanisms and efficacy of manual therapy for experimental pain sensitivity. With doctoral students and collaborators, Dr. George has authored over 120 peer-reviewed publications in physical therapy, rehabilitation, orthopedic, and pain research journals. Dr. George's teaching responsibilities in the Doctor of Physical Therapy program include participation in the evidence-based practice track. He currently serves as a contributing editor for physical therapy and an international editorial review board member for Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy. Finally, Dr. George has been an invited speaker at many national and international conferences and recognized with prestigious early career research awards from the American Physical Therapy Association, the American Pain Society, and International Association for the Study of Pain. Please join me in welcoming Dr. George, who will speak on an update on OPTIN, the Orthopedic Physical Therapy Investigator Network, putting it all together and early results. Thank you for this uh, tremendous honor. Um, I very much enjoyed hearing about Dr. Gresham before. Um, one of the things that I thought was kind of funny, actually, um, and even funnier now when I look at the slides, um, I always put the Z in my middle name, except for today. And um, the students, I can always tell in our class when they start to get comfortable for me, because they ask what the Z stands for. And it's very funny uh, because then, then they start calling me Stephen Z, and that's when they get too comfortable, and I remind them to stay away from that. So when I heard that, it made me chuckle. And then when the slides came up and the Z wasn't there, I thought, no one's going to believe me. Um, but I, I, I wanted to mention it anyways because it definitely uh, helped me uh, to uh, understand a little bit more the significance um, of this uh, person that you're honoring, and it is, it is quite an honor. I'd also like to, I know Lynn's not here, publicly thank Lynn. She hosted us with a wonderful dinner, and I know she supports this, um, this visiting professorship. Um, it's great to have someone who is willing to advocate for um, this type of event. As you are well aware, um, many programs don't have this opportunity, so it's great um, that you are taking advantage of it and um, making sure that it shines. And I'd finally like to thank uh, Patricia Hotaki. Um, she has been my host, the hostess with the mostess. Uh, so she's a kind, gracious host, um, even allows me to poke fun at her a little bit. So I have enjoyed, uh, I first got to know her about 12 years ago, and we've kept in touch working with uh, PTJ and um, have really enjoyed getting to know you and work with you and look forward to 12 more years at least of, uh, of working uh, together. So it's an honor to be here and um, hopefully um, I'll live up to that introduction now. I'll see how I do with uh, that very nice introduction. And I'll see, start off by uh, seeing if I can advance the slides, which is always a challenge. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is this um, opportunity we had to put together um, a clinical research network and um, first I want to acknowledge our team. I am here speaking with you. I'm the leader of the team. Um, but of course things like this happen with everyone contributing and we have a, a very talented team um, involving Jason Benichek and Joel Bielowski. Um, they are involved and Trevor are involved on, in Gainesville. Bob Rowe um, is in Jacksonville. And Sam Wu is our statistician, and Giorgio Zeppieri is another Gainesville person. So this was our original team um, that we had, and we're continuing to work on this project. See, I told you this is the, there we go. 
So wh the way I structured this talk is I wanted to talk a little bit about the process of putting together this clinical research network and then give you an idea of the design that it is and then talk, we have had some early results, talk a little bit about um, some of the information that we're gathering from this project. And hopefully there'll be time for lots of good questions. So the process. Um, this started in uh, 2012. Um, the orthopedic section, which for the non-physical therapists in the audience, is a section of the American Physical Therapy Association that um, provides funding opportunities. This was a special funding opportunity where they wanted to put together a clinical research network. Um, so they gathered what for the APTA is a substantial amount of funds and they put it out for competition. And as you can see, um, the purpose of the grant was to develop a clinical research network and there were some areas of um, emphasis there, uh, multi-center, they needed to look at specific practice patterns and it had to be in musculoskeletal conditions that are commonly managed by um, PTs. Um, so we kind of, um, as a group, we started talking about this and underlined, you know, some of the words that jumped out at us as what we were interested in. And as you can see, we focused in on that commonly seen diagnosis um, and then we started thinking of treatment, diagnosis, and prognosis as areas to build a theme around. This was an interesting call because not only did the section want you to develop a project, they also wanted you to develop a network. Usually you have to do one or the other. Um, this was something they wanted to do both. So we, were, we really were trying to balance what type of project we could do while building a network. So when we started thinking about this, um, we thought about the realm of diagnosis. And in, um, when you look big picture about what we know about musculoskeletal pain um, is really that there's a lot of tests that we use. And we know the accuracy of those tests. We know them enough that we didn't think we were going to find um, a magical test that suddenly was much more accurate than what a lot of the standards of care are. Um, there's also a theme in musculoskeletal pain where advanced diagnostic testing, imaging, um, is at the forefront now. Is, is really not that helpful and sometimes can actually be a detriment to clinical decision making. So we, we didn't think we wanted to focus on diagnosis was the bottom line from this, from where we were when we looked at the state of the art. Intervention, we thought, you know, there have been lots of high impact clinical trials. One of the things about musculoskeletal pain is they are, it's a, I call it a volume business. There's a lot of people that have musculoskeletal pain. As a result, there are lots of clinical trials in this area, and there are lots of lessons that we have learned from clinical trials. In fact, there are well-established clinical practice guidelines. Um, and the other thing with intervention is there are lots of outcome measures that are associated with um, musculoskeletal conditions. And the last thing we really wanted to do was create another outcome measure. Those have been done. Um, so when we started looking at the realm of intervention, we thought, again, some of this work has been done. Um, there's not really room in this mechanism to do a high-impact clinical trial. And the section has invested heavily in clinical practice guidelines. And I think, you know, it's not like there's an area where you say, you know, if we only had one more study in this area, it would clearly define where to go. So um, that left us with prognosis. And, and this, was an, this was on our brain anyways. Um, there have been some really uh, interesting advances in screening or early assessment in musculoskeletal pain. And the one that was on our brain at the time of this um, submission was the start back screening tool, which um, you may or may not be aware of. Right now, it, that's not important. We'll talk a little bit more about it in detail. But basically, this is a brief tool that has been used to stratify people on risk of poor outcome. It's nine items long. So we thought this is really interesting. This has been developed in primary care, and it is a powerful tool. People are making clinical decisions off of this, just this. And we thought that would be interesting um, if physical therapists had these tools too. So this was the area we kind of thought had some promise, this area of prediction. Um, are there tools that could be developed that would help with clinical decision making? Does that make sense to everyone? So what we really kind of settled on is, is there is a need for tools that facilitate quick and accurate determination of 
referral for more uh, diagnostic testing, um, if someone is likely to have a poor outcome, or an indication that we may need to involve other disciplines. And, and these types of decisions are the decisions that we think providers are going to be making in the future if they're not already making them now. So we looked at the literature and we thought two important decisions, prediction-related decisions, are whether or to determine whether or not someone has systemic involvement and whether or not someone has pain-related psychological distress. These are two, for musculoskeletal pain, these are two, sometimes they're called red flags and yellow flags, that's the clever graphic there, you'll see. I, I, I always, I, I bring the best graphics that 1998 can offer to my, uh, to my uh, what, I think it was just within the year actually, Microsoft announced they're no longer supporting clip art, and I, I kind of, you know, cried a little bit inside, because apparently you can search on the web and find a whole bunch of other images that aren't there, but, you know, I like to keep it kind of old school. But this is the red and yellow flag depiction for you visual learners. Um, but we think that those were two important prognostic decisions that need to be made, and there is an opportunity to have these decisions made at, um, quickly and in a standard way so that we can kind of scale this up. Everyone agrees that this is an important part of management, but then when you start looking at how people do it, they do it all different ways. So that was our, that was our cell. Obviously, the cell was successful because we, uh, we did the project, but that, that was, we didn't know that at the time. <laughs> I, that's important to realize, too. Okay, so as we're going on, so we have developed these acronyms because that's what good researchers do is they have acronyms, <laughs> and they make a lot of sense to us, so what we have found when we talk to other people, it's helpful if you guys understand what the acronyms stand for, too. So opt-in is the research network, so that is the places that collected data for us, um, or with us, I should say. The OSPRO is the cohort study that did the individual um, projects that I'll be talking about. The hope is that opt-in lives on um, and does other studies that have clever acronyms like OSPRO. So um, when I say that, when you hear opt-in, think more of the network and OSPRO is an individual project. So we thought that building these would allow for um, collaboration on um, important clinical research questions, and we were hoping, you know, one of the things that is very interesting, um, and I know this from working on the low back pain clinical practice guidelines, is we have really good guidelines for diagnosis, we have really good guidelines for intervention, but that prediction piece is missing. And part of the reason we think that prediction piece is missing is because there are so many different ways of doing it. So by standardizing it, we're hoping we can better inform clinical practice guidelines. And then as the, per our profession and others push to collecting data on larger scales, tools like this could be entered into outcomes databases. Uh, the APTA is working on a registry. At the time, the orthopedic section is working on an outcomes database. If you want to capture some of these elements, you have to have tools that can do it quickly and efficiently, and then you can start comparing across different clinics. So does that make sense to everyone? So this is really, this is our, was our schematic where we show um, right here our focus on screening and prognosis was, is first to add to the body that we felt was well established in diagnosis, intervention, and outcome, and then eventually get these things um, utilized in, in, at a larger scale in outcomes databases because then we'll really know if they can be helpful in clinical decision making. So, are there any questions on the process? Um, like I said, I just we like I like to do that to give a little bit of background of what we were thinking, um, because this is not a traditional funding mechanism. Um, this is something that the section did one time, and you know they're not going to do it again at this scale. But they are hoping that it lives on. So, any questions? I'm free to proceed. Okay. Friday rules are in effect, right? Keep it, keep it moving. All right. So one of the things then, um, so the design. <clears throat> so what we wanted to do is be purposefully broad with who we recruited. 
Um, and this is a little bit different than um, clinical studies that try to capture homogenous groups and an answer very specific questions. So when you see the inclusion criteria, if this looks vague to you, that's kind of what we were hoping for. Instead of excluding three out of four patients, we are hoping to include three out of four patients to make this more generalizable, to make this more um, useful. It also makes recruiting easier. Um, and as you can see, we focused on low back, neck, shoulder, and knee. Those are not, surprisingly, the four most common conditions. So we decided, instead of picking one, we decided to focus on them all. And this is part of the philosophical shift, which we've talked about a little bit, is in getting your head wrapped around that the back and the neck and the shoulder and the knee really might not be that different for what we're measuring here. And we can actually group them all together. And sometimes that is hard to get across to rehab professionals because they know those are different anatomically. But when we talk about them as pain generators and we talk about what influences outcomes, there's actually a lot of similarities. Um, so we were looking at those together. What we wanted to exclude are people that would already have outcomes that we were interested in. And our interests were really in transition to chronic pain, um, people with already having um, a psychiatric history, which we defined as um, active care from a medical health professional and a medication, two or more medications related to that. Um, we can't get too in-depth to their psychiatric history because that gets, kicks us to a different IRB level with the sensitive information, but we can screen at that level and say someone has a psychiatric history and we don't want to get that much further into it because um, that wasn't a focus of the study. And um, then current treatment for active cancer or, or neurologic disorders. So the OSPRO cohort study then was further divided into two phases. Um, a development phase in which the goal was to develop item banks and do psychometric analyses. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. In the development phase, all the sites were in Florida. We thought we needed to get this ball rolling before we went national, before we tour national, right? You got to play the smaller gigs and in close to home, build up your fan base, um, play the bars, play the small venues. So we were doing that. Um, that's a failed analogy, apparently. So um, <laughs> I'll keep going. Um, we worked with the people that we know really well in Gainesville and Jacksonville. And we had to get about 400 people into this in about a year. So that's the other advantage, is we didn't have to spend time building infrastructure. So we recruited for a little bit over a year. And this was, they completed demographic and clinical information, validated questionnaires for negative mood, comorbidity, functional status, pain. And this, this was a thick stack of papers. We still were at paper at this stage, because we didn't want to wait to get IRB approval to do it electronically. Um, so this was a one-time shot, but it basically filling out every questionnaire you might want someone to fill out. And, and basically the sell, the most effective sell to the participants was you are doing this so people in the future don't have to fill out this many papers. We're trying to streamline the process. Yes, it may take you 45 minutes, and I don't know if that's worth a $15 gift card or not. That's a, that's a value decision. You have to make that. But at least... You know, the goal isn't to add to this. The goal is to shrink this down. Um, so that was the sell. But it was a lot of information. But we also didn't want to get to the point where we were reducing uh, items and we hadn't, didn't have a large enough um, universe to look at. And um, there is a great joke in here. It is Friday, so I can tell a joke, right? Because, of course, we didn't use everyone's favorite flavor of the month or favorite questionnaire. And I love, uh, I work a lot with psychologists, and I love this quote from Mick Sullivan, who's at McGill. And he, he has said that the reason there's so many psychological questionnaires is because psychologists would rather use each other's toothbrush than their questionnaire. And I just thought that was one of the funniest things I've ever heard, so I'm sharing that with you. So if you're wondering why there are so many questionnaires, it's because they would rather use each other's toothbrushes than their other the measures, which I think is funny. So... We did, you know, this isn't everyone, um, but it is enough that we thought uh, we could get to what we wanted to. So here was the enrollment. Um, our goal was to get about 100 in each area. We did 
purposive sampling. So when we hit certain thresholds, we um, focused on others. And you can see the neck was, um, came in fourth place in this one. The low back tends to win these um, races to, uh, for recruitment. Excuse me, and the knee and the shoulder were um, about a, a little bit over 100. So that was the development study. The validation phase, which is still ongoing, was one of the things we wanted to do is because a lot of people develop these questionnaires um, and then they float in space, and especially psychologists, um, they don't test them longitudinally. They test them and they do factor analyses and they find these wonderful questionnaires that then aren't really ever tested. And we, we wanted to test this one right away, so we, we asked for and had the resources to do a follow-up study right on top of this. So the, the, the validation phase is the longitudinal study where we're going to take what we were developing and now look and see if it predicts outcomes. And we did that stage, so at least we'll know. We'll develop these items, and if they're horrible, at least we'll know. <laughs> you know, that's the worst case scenario. When people ask, well, aren't you worried? What if they're not predictive? And I'll say, well, at least, at least we'll know. We'll be the first ones telling people they're not predictive. Um, so that is, um, you know, that is the, the reason, and I think that's actually, for those of you who are interested in grant writing, um, I think that was actually a very strong point for this proposal, was that we just weren't going to have these floating around in ether. We were going to actually test them. Um, we have uh, about 460 for this. Um, that was the goal, and our job then was now to go to a wider region. Um, just in case Florida is weird, which if you listen to the news, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence to suggest that Florida is weird. As someone who trained and live in West Virginia, it's very refreshing to live in Florida and realize that a lot of people make fun of Florida, too. Um, so paying with alligators, did you hear that one, the, the drive-in? That was the recent one that kind of went national, where the person went through Wendy's and paid, tried to pay with an alligator, like threw the alligator in the, yeah. Yes, you don't even... Even if it weren't, I mean, the alligator obviously biases the location, but even if, you know, that happened in Florida. I know other states have that. So, so we, we, our goal was to be spread as much as we could. Um, and you can see we looked at um, different geographic locations, and I'll be more specific with them here. So the UF Health remained. Um, we reached out to ProAxis Therapy, which recently has changed their name, and they agreed to participate. Um, went to the Midwest, Indiana State, University of Southern California, and Los Angeles. Um, there's the Jacksonville site. Um, there was a site in Boulder. And then we also had a, two private practices, one in Willow Grove and one in Portland, Oregon, and then University of Illinois at Chicago. So um, if you see familiar names up there um, and you know those people, thank them. Uh, these people got, they got, they, they got an iPad to use to help them collect data, and that was it. So they really helped out of the kindness of their hearts and their willingness to help the section with what they thought was an important initiative. We couldn't provide salary support. We couldn't provide research assistant for support. What we did was we built an online data collection process that we thought was easy, um, and then we, the section sent them iPads to assist with the data collection. Um, so I think if you see names up there and, and you're talking to them, let them know that their work is appreciated. We thank them, um, but I think it's important that people realize that, you know, this was the type of, th these are the people that really made it happen. The outcomes we're looking at predicting um, at four weeks and six months and 12 months are pain intensity, pain interference, general health, and their region-specific disability. And then longer term, we want to see about that transition from acute to chronic. We also want to see if people change in comorbidities, um, see if they get sicker, and also additional health care utilization, and whether their satisfaction and expectations were met. We have completed recruitment. We didn't quite get 462. We got 439, which is pretty good um, in research to get that close to your target um, that's the marketing part. You always say you can get more, and then, you know, you get within reason there. Um, you can see, again, we just 
failed to get 100 in the neck, but everybody else was over 100, which we think will allow us to do what we want to do statistically. We can look at subgroups and see if these uh, are acting differently or acting the same. Um, and you can see the distribution by geographic region was, again, heavily weighted in the southeast um, with some representation in the west. And this is something, as the network continues, probably will have to be worked on. I can tell you with the resources we were given, we feel like this was a pretty um, first, fair first stab at it. Um, if you really want to do this right, um, the price tag is quite expensive to do something like that. And I'm not saying that as an excuse, by the way. I'm just letting you know that um, you know, I think this can be balanced out. I also think it's natural. You're going to have more representation in, in areas that you work with closely. Um, and we did, interestingly, the South Carolina site was the only place that um, took us up on our offer to do an in-person in-service. So um, I don't know if that was led to them being the next best contributor or if they already were going to be that way, but it was pretty interesting. And we did look to see if we could have South Carolina count in another geographic region, but it's pretty much always in the southeast. We thought, you know, maybe it's South Midwest or something like that, but it's, it's southeastern is what we found out. Here's what the two cohorts look like, and, and obviously this is one of those slides that you're not supposed to show. Um, but if you look at the male-female, you can see the development cohort and the validation cohort are both 60%, give or take, with female, so that is good. Um, the age is pretty close. So we, you know, these were, as I mentioned, purposely vague inclusion-exclusion criteria. But the good news is it looks like it captured very similar cohorts. And these are independent cohorts. These, you know, no one in the first one is part of the second one. And then when you start looking at things that may also matter, about three quarters had chronic pain. Um, again, that's good. And you look at the um, gradual, sudden, traumatic, you know, a lot, of, um, a lot of similarities there, which we think is encouraging because obviously you want these to be close enough so that you're not studying it a completely different group. Oh, yeah, definitely. Quick basic question. How is chronic pain defined for the purposes of that? We used the NIH definition for low back pain and just applied that to all of them. So I, I think it's half of the days in the past, what is it, six months now. And more. And I, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but that's the, that's the definition that we used. And that is the same definition we will use at 12 months. So it, it, if you already have it in the beginning, um, you know, obviously, there's a smaller amount that we'll be able to look at, about 100, to see if they transition from acute to chronic. But we will use the same definition. Because if you use different definitions, then it might, you know, it might throw it off. Yeah. But this is what, ha you know, as people who practice know, this is, this is generally what your practice mix looks like. Any other questions? Okay, so some early results. We have started disseminating the results from the development cohort. The, the validation cohort will not be completed until December, so um, we, we are just kind of, um, we're in the, you know, monitoring follow-up rate for that. So one of the things that, as I mentioned earlier, is we, we think for these measures that back, neck, knee, and shoulder may be more alike than different. So one of the things we wanted to do was test that assumption and see if you can use some of these yellow flag tools across different anatomical regions and if they tell you the same thing. So this was presented by one of our PhD students, Katie Butera, at Combined Sections and she has graciously let me use her slides as part of my talk and I always say because she wants to graduate. Um, so um, the start back screening tool is the one I mentioned that started us thinking. And it's been used in primary care primarily for low back pain. Um, and what it does is it stratifies people into low, medium, or high risk of continuing disability. Um, it's on a scale from zero to nine. So one of the things we thought is we could study this tool, not worry about creating these categories, and just look at the overall score to get a risk score. Because the, the score is directly rated related to the categories, but it's only been established in low back pain. 
And we really didn't want to develop categories for each area. We didn't have a large enough sample to do that. But we wanted to see if this kind of a relationship is the same across all of the areas. So we modified the tool and we started looking at it. The reason we want to do this is there have been successful management models where that tool is used to make a decision about the way a person's low back pain is managed in the United Kingdom. If you're high risk, you get an immediate referral to physical therapy. The physical therapy is implemented in a psychologically informed way. And they did a start back trial, and they found that that was a more cost effective way to manage low back pain. Um, we think there's potential for all of musculoskeletal pain to be managed that way, but one of the things we have to figure out is does this tool behave um, in a similar fashion in non-low back pain um, patient populations. So our hypothesis is basically that it's going to, the start back tool when it's modified is going to act the same across all of our conditions. And this, I, you know, just pause here for a second. Because most of the time, you know, you don't hypothesize things are going to be the same. You, you're looking for differences. We actually think they're going to be the same. Um, the way uh, we wanted to do that is we were taking clinical measures of health status, pain intensity, and disability that the start back tool is already known to be associated with. And then we were testing if there was an interaction between that score and their body region. So basically, that would tell us if the bot if, if there was an interaction, that meant there was a different association for that measure based on the region. And I'll show you in pictures. It's easier in pictures. So the methods of this were, um, this was from the cross-sectional study, so everything was captured during their evaluation. Um, we modified the tool. These are the clinic measures that we had access to. Um, the first two are used the same for everyone, and then we had a matching region-specific disability questionnaire based on back, knee, shoulder, neck. If you're into regression, you'll like this slide, but basically it'll, it'll show you that we, we built the models all the same. We controlled for things that people typically control for, age, sex, pain duration, whether the pain was work-related, and whether they had surgery. Those are important predictor variables where the region was, then their score on the test, and then the one that we're really interested in is the interaction. Yes? Sure, there, so, um, you know, I have felt horrible and depressed in the past two days. Um, it asks whether your pain is in different areas, so... Um, the back pain asks whether you have pain in your shoulders and your neck. We modified it just to say, do you have pain outside of your primary area? Um, there is a catastrophizing question, I think, and there's a worry question. So it, it, it basically captures with one item anxiety, depression, catastrophizing, fear, location, and bothersomeness. So it asks you, you know, how bothersome your pain has been over the past week. And I can dig up, you know, we, I, I don't think I have it here. Katie had it, in case someone asked that at CSM. But, uh, you know, the mentor never has the details, right? So, um, but I can dig that up. Any other question? And those are just basically agree or disagree. Um, there actually are different ways of doing those items, but we just use the agree and disagree. So... Um, what you can see is one of the things that's nice about this is for all the measures, the third step was that the interaction didn't add anything. So that was a strong suggestion to us that the type of region didn't impact not the overall score, but the association of that score with this outcome measure. So, um, and then when you go back and look, actually, the strongest individual predictor was their start back score which is consistent with what we've done this in back pain. If you're wondering what tends to predict outcomes, um, it's whether they've had surgery or not, and then the start back score. Like if you were building out of all those factors that I showed you and you had to pick two predictors that were statistically reliable, it would be the surgery, yes, no, and their start back score. And the baseline score of their factor. So this is what it looks like with pictures. So you can see if there are interactions, these lines would have different slopes. These lines don't have different slopes. They're all in the same 
um, general direction showing a positive association with pain intensity, which means the higher your start back score is, the higher your pain intensity score was. And the correlations range from 0.545 to 0.53. For disability, it was even tighter. Um, basically, all the correlations were about the same. So this was some preliminary indication that we might be able to use the same screening tool for all of these regions, which to us kind of felt like we already knew this, um, but to other folks, um, you know, it w it's, it's interesting. But I think it shows that some of these factors that are related to the psychological beliefs about pain and disability um, have this kind of you know, I don't want to say universal, but they're, they're definitely, they're encompassing across many different regions. And the start back tool was the strongest contributor. So the, our first kind of lesson from the development cohort was for that, for yellow flag screening, I think we can become more efficient with it. And in fact, you know, we have another, um, another story that's a little bit longer um, that supports that. The second thing that came out of the, um, of the development cohort was this um, development of a screening tool for red flags, which we originally called the red flag screening tool, but we were corrected during the review process that it's a review of systems tool. So I will slip, but I will try to call it, it, it it's a review of systems tool. And we can talk about why that may be. And I think the reviewers are right. Um, we did people do get a little sloppy with the red flag terminology. So basically, this is the first step to every examination. You're supposed to find out if there's any signs or symptoms of systemic involvement. Sometimes it takes no time at all. Sometimes it's much more involved. But everyone agrees this is an important part of management, especially if you want to be a first-line provider. You don't want to miss these things. Um, what is very interesting is when you look at how this important step is done, there's, there's incredible variability in how it's done. Um, and there's not a lot of clinical research in this area. So we started playing around um, with this and found there's a small body of literature, and almost all of it is case reports, which means that someone is going back and saying, you know, we identified this special case and we think it was related to this red flag, which is the opposite of how you want to use these. You want to identify them forward. Um, one of the better studies of this was done in Australia, um, which was an inception cohort for acute low back pain, which I didn't even know these existed, but they do. Um, they're very hard to capture. Um, people were followed for a year, and 11 out of 1,172 had serious pathology. And what is very interesting is um, five of those were identified at initial evaluation with red flag screening. Um, six were falsely identified. So for the DPT students in the audience and the others, you know, that's, that's what I call, um, and when I teach EBP, that's what I call monkey rate, right? That's flipping a coin rate. The, the monkeys could do as good of job as we could in identifying because they identified as many true positives and as many false positives. So that's a coin flip. And peop that's not how we typically like to make decisions. Um, so this questions the, uh, the accuracy rate of this uh, process. Um, I liked this model. This was a model from, I think, from Catherine Roach in, in um, almost 20 years, or more than 20 years ago now. I think the real question isn't maybe whether they have underlying pathology. I think that's an important question, but that the previous study suggests we're just not very good at identifying it early. Um, this is maybe more the question is, is, are people likely to benefit from conservative care or medical care. And, and they developed um, in a study, basically in their study, it looked like trouble with sleeping, um, night pain, was an indication that they were going to um, need medical or surgical care in this particular prediction model. They didn't follow this as best I can tell, but I like this model because it removed this review of systems question from whether you have underlying pathology to what is the outcome going to be and are you going to be managed in a different way. So that alternate approach was what we used in moving forward. Um, and we thought 
in order to do this, it needs to be done in a standard fashion. Um, so we started looking for tools, and guess what? They didn't, they didn't exist. So we had to literally go back to step one. The yellow flags one, we could pick different questionnaires that have been established. For, the re the, for this review of systems, we couldn't. So we had to develop an item, ad, item bank. And, and we ha luckily, we have someone on our team who really, really enjoys doing literature searches. So he, his name is up there, Jason Benichick. Um, he loves literature searches. So we let Jason loose. Um, and you can see he did a Medline database and did, I mean, he's very good at it. He could explain it better than I could. But um, basically what we found or what he found was um, there was about 1,500 um, citations that led to 1941 titles reviewed. And we excluded a lot of those. We did some of this together to make sure we were making the same decisions. And we ended up with 157 total, our full studies reviewed. And of those, there was 118 that we looked at. And here's what happens, and it's very similar to what I said before. The vast, you know, the majority of these, 57, are case reports. The other 40 are review studies, which you know, are basically reports of case reports. Uh, so we have 97 of the studies that looked at this that would be, most people would classify as very low or maybe not even um, evidence. Um, look at the number of prospective studies that have looked at this. It was two. Um, so this was very interesting. The other thing that was very interesting is there were two textbooks, and you probably know them, that kept popping up in the citation searches. So there are two seminal textbooks in our literature that have very heavily influenced um, the review of systems and red flag assessment. When you look at the different systems that are screened, um, a lot of these have potential for overlap. We kind of force them into systems. That doesn't mean that the item may not still have value if we put it in one system. Um, and you can see um, cardiovascular, nervous, and musculoskeletal are kind of the leading systems that were, were screened. So after all of Jason's hard work, we basically found there have been 97 unique symptom assessment items that have been reported, either in textbooks or in the peer review, that may have benefit for identifying underlying pathology or someone with systemic involvement. So you with me? So we needed to recruit a cohort to fill out. So this is, you can see how this paperwork is getting fatter now. We have 97 items that they're asking, you know, dizziness, um, sleeping at, or waking at night, things like this. This was our development cohort, which we've already seen. So see how fast it is to recruit 430 people? That was only one step, one step and one slide. Um, what we wanted to do then um, was look at how to identify responders. And we... We talked about this a lot. Um, you know, there's item IRT. There's a lot of different ways to do this. But this is where Sam, our statistician, had a different way of thinking about it. And eventually, we came around to it. So we defined a responder as anyone who marked one of those 97 positive. And that, it, believe it or not, that's what typically has been done in the literature, is if you respond to one of those, you're a positive responder. So um, that is a yes to any of those 97. Importantly, we did not test, we did not have the time, resources, to test for presence of pathology. And this is where we moved away from using red flag terminology. I think if, if, you, if we had tested everyone for the presence of pathology, we could have called it a red flag tool, but we did not test for presence of pathology. That would have been very, very expensive. And we already know the false positive rate for that is probably as high as the true positive rate. So here is what we found. 91% had a one positive, or were positive responders, so marked one of those. Um, they tended to be older, lower income, female, and have back or neck pain. Um, this should not be considered a prevalence estimate, but it is very similar to the acute low back pain cohort, 80%. So we were in the ballpark with this. This is, if you have looked at this, and it's not a huge literature, people tend to report at least one of these symptoms. The statistical analysis that we did is, I think, really neat. This was the part that took us non-statisticians a little bit longer to figure out. And, and sa what Sam did is he set up, so think of all 97 items, and you want to 
predict who responded positive to at least one of them. So what he did, did was develop three item sets that would predict that. So there's a whole bunch of potential three item sets. And he took those, and the ones that had the highest accuracy um, were the ones we started combining to get to um, what the tool might look like. And it's very easy to see what happens here with this pattern. So on the bottom are the number of screening tool items and the percentage, which I think you can see there, is the accuracy of predicting a responder. So you can see with the best three items set, got 41%. So just with three items, you would get less than half of the people who are any responders. Um, where we kind of started seeing the plateau was right around 10. So with 10 items, we could get 94% of the people who responded yes to any of the 97. Um, to get complete accuracy, we had to get, you had to get to 23. So does everybody see that pattern? And you can definitely see where there's gain, and you can definitely see where it levels off. Actually, it does. So here's, yeah, this, I, we don't, so the, if your favorites are on here, that this is where the part of the game where people like to say, is my favorite red flag question on there? Um, so you can see, have you recently experienced abnormal sen sensations? 161, that identified 161 of the responders. Um, constipation, night sweats, lightheadedness, night pain. So this is, this is the 10. Um, we wanted to sell it as the 10, and during the review process, they wanted us to push it to 23 because they wanted 100% accuracy. Um, we're testing both of them to see which one is going to be accurate, accurate in um, a longitudinal study. Briefly, we can look at the construct validity of this. Um, so we wanted to know, one of the things, one of my goals of this was to get rid of red flag assessment or comorbidities. Because I, I, I didn't want to assess both. I thought maybe they're the same thing. And it, you can look and see how good was that thought of mine. Um, like a lot of thoughts, not very good. The Charleston comorbidity index was correlated 0.2 with the red flag items that we looked at. So that's not very high correlation. Um, the functional comorbidity index was a little bit higher. But these are not the same as comorbidities. So the symptoms they're reporting are not overlapping with the symptoms they were. So we were a little bummed with that because we kind of wanted to kill two birds with one stone and just have a list of items that if you respond to this, it is enough to tell you about a comorbidity and it's also enough to tell you about your current symptoms. The PHQ is a measure of depressive symptoms and it actually had um, a strong correlation with their uh, red f the review of systems questionnaire. The other thing this graph shows is when people do all 97, excuse me, or when they do 10, um, there's no test, there's no difference in the correlation except for depression. Um, depression got, the association got a little bit weaker, but it's still positively correlated. So what this tells us is we get the same information, the same association with 10 or 97. So this is an indication, again, that we can do this in a more efficient way. Is everybody on board with that? And it didn't differ by anatomical region, by the way. <clears throat> so, you know, we're between 10 and 23, depending on what your tolerance is for the accuracy. And this is the first attempt that we're aware of to kind of standardize these. And, and it, it, it will be interesting um, to see how this is used. We've already gotten some feedback. Some people are already starting to play around with this tool. The group in South Carolina has, they are in a healthcare system where they have direct access. So they've started using this tool. And they have a rule that if someone marks more than two, um, the PT has to collaborate with a physician. Um, so it, it, it'll be interesting to see. Um, how people use this. And just to show you, because um, not everything you publish people care about or even read, um, there are, have already been inquiries, and Germany is all over this. Germany likes this for some reason. Um, but there have been a lot of, lot of, lots of interest. Yes, me and David Hasselhoff are going to tour Germany. It will be awesome. Um, so when we get to, uh, are, are there any questions on the review of systems? I know it went quickly, but that's also the vibe I'm getting. And um, 
there are, there, this is a published paper, so if you want to read the technical aspects of it, um, you certainly can. It was, it was a great learning experience for us because we developed this using different techniques, which in the end I think um, were, were good techniques for this particular um, clinical question. So this is where we are now. We, in a story I didn't tell you, um, we did develop the yellow flags tool, and it has an option of 10 or 17. And we have a review of systems tool that's 10 or 23. And that's what we're testing right now in the ongoing validation study. And, you know, the hope is that we will refine these screening tools and be able to um, incorporate them in larger databases. And I think they will be refined not only by us but other people, and that's great. I mean, that's what these tools are. I can envision there being a, a core that is really robust, and then you have different items you might want to add depending on um, patient population or maybe regions that you're looking at. I can tell you, you know, we didn't recruit people um, with women's health. We, you know, this was kind of the, the garden variety musculoskeletal pain with neck, back, shoulder, knee pain. So some items that may not have shown up may be more prevalent or mean more in different patient populations. So as I mentioned, this work has been starting to be disseminated. This is the Review of Systems paper, if you're interested. Um, this paper uh, is the Yellow Flag tool, which is a very, I don't know, it's, it's a technical story, so we, it's not doesn't travel well. Um, and then the Start Back Screening tool. So if you're interested in any of those details, those are um, forthcoming. They're all available. Um, ahead of press. So um, these are names of people that helped collect data within um, our Florida contingent. So we're obviously also very um, thankful for their participation. And then our sources, which I'm lucky enough to get supported by Brooks to um, do things like this. And then, of course, the orthopedic section, um, which made gave us the uh, the inspiration, I guess, to come up with this and then provided the resources to do it. And then one of the things that is, is I think, if they're interested in this, is the, the section is going to have these clinical research network small grants um, for people to, you know, have access to those sites to have specific clinical questions. They don't have to be related to anything I talked about, or they could be. Um, and what is nice is you can use that alone or you can combine it with the existing um, section funding mechanism. So um, one of the things I have told them I would do is plug that. So I'm plugging it now. But um, they want people to be aware of that um, because sometimes I think uh, people think these research opportunities are a closed network, but they're really not. You know, they want they want to have 50 applications for their calls. They don't want to have two. They had 13 for the clinical re research network call, which I thought was, which they thought was about right. Um, but I know some years these have been underutilized. So, so that is um, that is the tour, or that is the update of opt-in. Um, I am happy to answer questions if people have any. There have been a few along the way, but I also fully acknowledge it's Friday afternoon, so.